And uh, basically what we do is we download a bunch of mobile apps. We don't have the source code, obviously. We strip them apart, see what's in them, see what they do. Um, this tool was designed to kind of get at these queries a lot faster. Basically, there's this thing called BYOD, bring your own device. Companies, they don't care if you bring your phone to work anymore, but they want to make sure that nasty stuff isn't on it. Um, so things that our customers care about, stuff like seeing the you did sent in the clear, seeing the address book sent out, sending the email archive sent out. I bet half of you guys who work with mobile apps, I could probably talk shit on the security of them. But that's besides the point. <laughs> um, this is an abbreviated list, obviously. We have thousands of signatures to look for crappy security policies that developers do. Once again, we don't have the source code to your apps. We have to break them open. Uh, you know, we use stack analysis, dynamic analysis. Here you're seeing some small a, some class methods that we're looking at, specifically this is the Adlib adware, um, whether it's adware or not, besides the point. Dynamic analysis, this is a screenshot from a dev environment that I took earlier today. Uh, we, we literally load these apps up on mobile devices, run them through, you know, run some money, monkey runners on them and so forth and collect this data. So this is, this is the problem that I'm setting up. We're collecting all this data on the apps. Right now we have like five million apps in our collection that we've downloaded from the markets. They're from third party markets. We have all these different signatures that we're collecting on them, you know, that, that we showed. So where does this data go and where can, where can we query it from? As you can tell, this is not Go. <laughs> so, so you'll see these little methods spread all throughout the code. But what you'll note is it's a single app set membership. It's not on an entire collection. That's actually not like an easy problem to do. And so, so we have these. Of course, then you have Joe Bob Boss, and he has his random ask query of the day. I like all the apps that connect to Dropbox, persist text messages, and send it all in the clear back to the servers. You'd be surprised about how many apps actually do this and don't care. Um, so we run these queries, and these queries just take like, you know, a long time to run, and it's, it's not efficient. It's not efficient to store. It's not efficient to query. It's just a pain in the ass. Um, so after a while, it's like, well, you know, how long does this take? You know, 40 seconds to get the cardinality of one signature. That's, that's insane. You know, we, we need these answers like this. We need it sub-second. Um, so we started kind of like looking around. But of course, to do that, you really have to define your problem first. To jump into a problem without really defining it is really stupid. So what we're looking at right now, and I know I didn't label the X, Y axis. I, I understand. <laughs> but uh, this is a distribution of our uh, signatures versus the number of apps. That stuff in the upper right corner, those are obviously like really bad because they're so out there that they, their, their meaning is completely lost. Um, so gra graphing your data like this will give you quite a bit of insight. But this, is, this was the first thing before we wrote, wrote a single line of code was let's figure out what this data really is because we had never really looked at it as a whole. We had just kind of been like, oh, well, you know, Facebook, it connects to Facebook, you know, and they're, they're you know, sending the you did in the clear and all this sort of stuff. Um, but to get this like real set identification, that was kind of like what we're looking for. Five million apps, thousand signatures. You know, one signature might, might be tempting to rip your, root your phone. Another one's sending the location. All those different location-based apps that are just sending back all sorts of stuff. You know? Uh, the other one, you know, it, it eats little kittens. Um, so so what, what did I want to achieve here? Well, I wanted, I wanted a networkable daemon, right? Obviously. Um, it needs to perform these large in-memory data set operations. Your anding, your oring, your xoring, your nodding, all this stuff. It needs to deal with concurrency in like a really decent manner. You know, I don't, I don't want to just sit there and go into template hell, right? Um, obviously not Ruby. Most of the code in our shop is Ruby. There's a portion that's C++, a portion that's subject to C, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we go, go. <laughs> uh, we got a couple main components in it, right? We have this HTTP layer. Basically, it just sits there and listens for requests. We got this query layer 
this is the query engine. I kind of come from more of a grammar background, so when I mean query, it's tab bit, tab bit more than select star. Um, persistence, obviously, that can be very tricky when you combine all these different things together. Um, so just kind of jumping in, and this is not idiomatic Go code at all. This is kind of like crap that I just pasted in. <laughs> but anyways, figured the best thing to show was the testing that Go provides right out the door is excellent. Um, you don't have to install RSpec. You don't need to install Cucumber. You don't need all these like third party, you know, gym mess. You just kind of get going and coding right away. And this is, you know, in so many lines of code, you can kind of test this expectation. Same thing with query, you know, let's do a, let's do a, a grand balance check. Very, very quick and easy to do. Well, once again, our, our parser and fix notation, no one's going to try to write the others. This is kind of like what we were trying to go towards, where we could write something like this and then output, you know, our cardinality or output the entire set in a JSON response. Uh, right now you have, you have something that is dirty as this. Obviously we're kind of looking for a sweeter DSL, but this is, this is kind of where we're at, at right now. Um, but just keep in mind, this query earlier for one of those was about 40 seconds. So if I wanted to get the cardinality of 14099, I don't know what the hell that is. That, that, that might be like, um, I, don't, I, I don't know, emails your cat at midnight every night. I, I don't know what it means. But uh, let's, let's say that. That was like 40 seconds to query on right now. Well, right now, that query came back in you know, 100 microseconds or whatever that is, 0.01. Um, so we get our cardinality and we get our list. And now we can actually go back to the guy, that uh, the, uh, the Dilbert cartoon guy, and we'd be like, oh, by the way, here's the answer to your query. Obviously, you can do this with many languages, but Go presented many things that allowed us to do this in a very fast and efficient manner. Not, not just because it's statically typed, not just because it's a compiled language, not just all this other stuff, but because of the development efficiency. I don't have to like go out and figure out all this crap libraries that some other third party coder wrote because it's easier. You know, it's, it's not easier. Uh, this is easier. Some, some takeaways, go format, go test, static like type compiled. Right there, the test suites, I'm not, I'm not gonna say it's 100% covered. I mean, this is, this is pivotal, so like, I, I won't just like sit here and lie. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, but seriously, if this was a C++ program, you know, I mean, that, that would be so much longer. You know, tested, compiled, everything. Uh, this was supposed to be like a five minute, 10 minute thing, so anyways, just, just kind of like a go success story. We, uh, we really enjoyed it, and we kicked this product out in like less than, I don't know, le less than a month. It was basically one of those Christmas projects, so. So NCD, so on, on, I'll give some background first on CoreOS. So CoreOS is a new Linux, uh, distribution, um, and sort of where we started with it, uh, we looked around at how people are actually using Linux operating systems um, in production, and a lot of times they aren't really uh, taking a lot of um, the packages or a lot of the effort that um, these these vendors are putting into the um, operating system and using it as is. They package up all the dependencies, whether it be like Node.js or Java or whatever, um, and so the application is pretty pretty well removed pretty well removed from um, the actual base operating system. And so um, it kind of gave us an opportunity to think about what a Linux operating system might be um, if we could design it slightly differently because people more and more are moving their applications away from um, the actual OS. And one of the first things that we wanted to do was sort of build something that uh, could perhaps help the security um, stance that a lot of people have around their operating systems. Um, they oftentimes will, you know, every once in a while think about remembering that last time they ran the app get upgrade or app get update. Um, and it might have been a really long time since they've rebooted their machine. Um, and so what we wanted to do was kind of move to a push model where we act more like the browsers, um, like Chrome or Firefox, where updates actually get delivered to your servers. 
Um, and that's part of why uh, the consumer internet has moved so quickly in the last few years and why security on the consumer internet's um, improved so well in the last few years is because these browsers are able to push. And so we, we tried to, to think about how we could do that on the server. Um, and what we arrived at is we're going to be rebooting a lot of people's servers a lot of the time. And um, what that meant was we needed to build a data store, um, something like uh, like the Chubby um, at paper at Google or Zookeeper or something like this. Um, and we didn't set out to build this originally. It just came out of what we needed to do um, in order to build uh, CoreOS. So what etcd is, is it's, um, it's a highly available key value store for shared configuration and service discovery. And so immediately everyone has this perfect picture of exactly what I'm talking about in mind, right? Um, probably not true. So I'll walk you through um, what it means. Uh, the first is going to be the super contentious one um, among distributed systems people of what I mean by highly available. So let's get that out of the way. Um, yeah, it's Apache license written in Go, which is why uh, I'm here. So um, highly available means, in this case, uh, that it's um, partition tolerant. Um, but so say we have this uh, five node cluster with etcd peers. Um, it's currently the cluster is available, and we're able to write to it. It's available, and we're able to write to it. It's available, and we're able to write to it. It is unavailable, and we can only read from it. Um, and that's what I mean by highly available, um, is that s a certain number of the nodes, a quorum of the nodes, uh, have to be, um, if they're up, then you're able to, to write to etcd. Um, it's a key value store. Um, so if you're familiar with um, Zookeeper, uh, it has a similar layout, or even the Unix file system. Um, so you have directories, and underneath directories, you have actual um, value nodes. So uh, everything is called a node, um, sort of somewhat following the Unix tradition of like D nodes and I nodes, but um, there's, there's directory nodes and there's value nodes. And uh, the value can just be a simple string. Um, a lot of people end up encoding JSON or whatever into that uh, value, um, but it can be whatever you want. And so uh, what, what, what is this useful for? So we have this kind of file system thing that we can write to. Um, what it's really useful for is, is shared configuration. So I need to share this bit of data, whether it be like a password or um, you know, some configuration values of what hosts uh, you should be contacting for this particular service, et cetera. Um, and then discovery of services. So you may have a directory that's a bunch of back-end web servers that then need to be inserted into a load balancer or something. Um, but it turns out that discovery is usually not enough. Um, you can't just, like, DNS is, is discovery, right? You can just publish information. Um, but oftentimes, applications are more complicated than that. They can't just get a list of IP and that's going to be enough for you to do um, everything you need to do around services. You also need locking, um, which means that you need to be able to change a value atomically and have that value um, viewable throughout the rest of the cluster. <clears throat> so um, that's, that's sort of why we had to build, build etcd. We can't just like build it on a cache or a Mongo or something. Is um, you, you need the atomic nature of the thing. Um, so here's a simple. We're going to just run through a simple example of how an application with etcd might work. So an uh, application comes up and it says, uh, where's my DB? Um, there's none up yet, so it's like etcd responds, sorry, there's no database. Um, so the application says, or an uh, agent on behalf of the application says, okay, I'll just wait and, and watch uh, on a directory for a uh, database to come up. And then a uh, Postgres comes up and there's an agent acting on behalf of Postgres, or Postgres has logic built into it. It says, is there a DB master yet? Um, and etcd says, sorry, there's no DB master, so you're it. Uh, make sure you come up in master mode. Um, and so the application has been sitting there watching on this key for a database. It says, woohoo, a database appeared. And so it can now um, start making database queries. It's like, yes, select star from awesome. and uh, the Postgres or an agent on its behalf starts heart beating, saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Um, and this is, everything's fine. Like the, the application came up, everything's being registered and coordinated through etcd. Um, 
So uh, the application continues to watch, and Postgres continues to heartbeat save the life. Um, a new Postgres node comes up, and it says, uh, can I be DB master, please? And uh, etcd replies, etcd has a, a leader election API. Um, etcd replies through the leader election API, um, sorry, uh, master exists, and you, he is sitting here, so you need to talk to him about you know, getting your wall file and um, setting yourself up into slave mode. Um, meanwhile, he starts heart beating. Um, nothing's really changed the application. Uh, you know, there's been no leader change. Um, so heart beating's happening, uh, and everything's fine. The application is stable. Um, you're not getting paged. So everyone's really happy. Oh, uh, dang it. There's been a horrible network partition. AWS is down. Something bad has happened. Um, so heartbeats stop arriving to etcd. Uh, and what happens here is that the leader election um, API that it's heart beating to, the slave's heart beating to, um, finally notifies it after a TTL. Um, I have some bad news. <laughs> you are now the new master. And um, the application has been watching on the database key and it sees that there's a new database, a new master in town, re reconfigures itself, and once again is able to run its queries. Um, so the partition goes away. The whole cycle begins again. You know, the, the new node comes back up after the partition. It's like, huh, okay. It asks if it can become master. It gets denied, and um, things are good. So uh, it's not generally enough to just have discovery. You also need to have things where um, there's a consistent view of the cluster. So you can do things like master election or say, I need X number of these workers out in the cluster. Um, I need to configure this elastic IP on AWS to this one node. You can't eventually consistent on an elastic IP, right? Like, there's one IP, it's one resource. Somebody has to own it. Okay, so which brings, that's, that's how sort of etcd works. Now we'll get into the interesting bits is the underlying um, technology uh, and algorithm. The, the algorithm that we use is called Raft. Um, it's a paper that came out um, from a PhD uh, student at, from Stanford. Um, I believe last year uh, he published a paper, um, Diego, and uh, Diego is currently writing his thesis, and uh, I got really good news from Diego a few weeks ago. He said that he had to change his PDF viewer because scrolling was too slow. So that means he's making really good progress. <laughs> the thesis is getting long enough that he may just graduate. Um, so, so, yeah, it, I don't, like, nobody understands Pax, I don't understand Paxos. So I, I couldn't tell you well enough. I, it gives you the similar uh, guarantees to Paxos. Um, and so it's, it's similar to like Zab, I've been told, which is Zookeeper's underlying protocol. I mean, the reason Diego wrote Raft is because he, he as a PhD student, um, had a difficult time understanding consistency algorithms. And me as a lowly engineer, has never understood consensus algorithms before I read the Raft paper. Um, and so the, the entire paper is trying to build an understandable consensus algorithm. Um, and I think he did a pretty good job because there's about 30 different implementations in various languages now um, of, of the Raft consensus algorithm. Yeah, it's been published and there's um, several open source ones. I'm actually gonna talk about the Go Raft library, um, which you can use to build things on top of it. Um, so yeah, it's about building or having a consensus across multiple machines, right? So um, every node in the cluster has the exact same value, or in cases perhaps a value that had been previous, but they not. It's not like eventually consistent. It's like hard consistent. Um, so one one nice thing that's happened uh, in the Raft community is how do I exit? This is interesting. Yeah, I can only go forward. This has never quite happened. Huh. <laughs> it only lets me go forward. I'm going to the end. Okay. Um,
So uh, one of the GoRapt authors, um, Ben B. Johnson, uh, created uh, this thing called the secret lives of data.com, um, which is really helpful because it provides some basic, uh, uh, some basic visualizations of Raft and some other consensus algorithms and distributed systems algorithms. Um, and so in this example, we have like, we have a three node Raft cluster. And um, what we're gonna do is just go through and do like a basic master election and visualize it. And then also build a consensus on a single value. Um, so uh, this is a single node. Um, and a node in Raft can either be in uh, a peer or a follower state, which is visualized by having no border. Um, it can be in a, um, it can be in a, um, in a candidate state, which means that it's, uh, it's put in its, uh, a, a vote to the cluster, um, and it's trying to become the leader, or a leader state, which means that a, a um, quorum of the cluster has said, yes, um, we think that you are, uh, are a great leader. Um, so, yeah. It's sort of like democracy in an algorithm. So um, what we'll see here is one of the nodes turns into a candidate, and it puts out a vote request to the other uh, nodes in the cluster. Um, the nodes then say, yes, um, we agree. Uh, you can become the leader. Then he's in a leader state. Um, and so this means that he all, all rights get routed through the leader. Um, so what will happen next is we'll get a, um, a client, and the client would like to write five um, into the data store, or into the log in this case. And um, so he gets a command that says set five. The leader gets a command that says set five. And it distributes this, out, distributes this um, to all the other peers in the cluster. They say, OK, we got set five. Leader's like, okay, the new value is five, and then it tells everyone else to commit this value. Once it's been committed to the log, then we can now finally reply back to the client, okay, um, we got your um, request, and the new value of the cluster is five, or of the value is five. So that's basically how the, the Raft algorithm works uh, at a low level. Great, now I'm on the last slide. Okay, uh, so that, that's how it works. Let's just dive into some code and see how etcd actually works. Um, so what I have here is um, I brought up uh, a cluster of three machines um, in Tmux. So this, this here is um, the, the first peer, peer one, and then peer two, and then peer three. Uh, and it's just dumping a bunch of logs. Um, so if I was to say like nuke one of them, it's gonna start panicking and saying, Heartbeats have failed the peer two, um, and I'll start them back up, and everything's fine. So, uh, and etcd has some nice things where we can actually visualize the cluster a bit. So we have, obviously, this is all running on localhost, so I'm getting really killer latencies here. Um, but like on AWS, uh, it does not look so good. Um, so those numbers spike um, readily, and. Um, we also have a little key browser. I don't have any keys uh, in this database yet, because I just or in this cluster because I just started it. But it, we have a little dashboard um, for you to play around with. And the, the cool thing about this is this is all just client side code. Um, since etcd uses an HTTP um, interface and JSON, uh, we actually this is just all um, Angular JS and jQuery and and um, stuff. So uh, that's that. Um, so we brought up a uh, etcd cluster, and we can, um, you know, nuke individual nodes, and we can see that like failure counts start increasing um, as the leader is panicking because append entry requests aren't aren't getting applied, um, and heartbeats are failing. Um, and then we, you know, stabilize the cluster again, and things stop failing. Everything's good. Kind of acts how you you would expect. Um, so that's an etcd cluster. Uh, and the API is, is rather straightforward. Using the etcd CTL, which is the command line utility built on go etcd, um, which is the client API uh, library. And so we just set this, this key called configuration db with some JSON payload. Um, and you can see, we can start to actually look at the API a little bit. 
by adding the debug flag, which gives us out an actual curl line. Um, so if we wanted to, and the quoting was right, dang, um, then we could have ran that through curl. Here we'll do something like git, and then we can. Cool, so it, it just acts as um, a regular HTTP client with some additional smarts. Um, and that, that's one of the, the clients to that CPE. Um, and the, the API is fairly restful. It's as restful as we could really get um, by trying to like push a file system on top of like HTTP semantics. Um, it's a little difficult to map that cleanly. Um, so like you, you get to like cat a value, you use git, um, the HTTP git verb to put a value or to set a value you put. Um, and then we have invariants like only set if the index, um, the index is like the uh, logic clock within the etcd cluster. So um, you can say things like only set this value if the index is equal to like 117 or something. Yeah. All right. So uh, Go etcd is the library that you can use from Go to do the to interact with etcd, um, and instead of like diving through and giving you the full like view of what the client can do, it does what you'd expect. There's get functions, and there's set functions, and there's set if value functions. Um, but there's really three uh, important things to keep in mind. The first is that when you create the new client, you only have to give one valid IP into the into the etcd cluster. Um, and then you have to call sync cluster. And sync cluster reads, uh, it talks to the first IP that it can talk to, and then it caches a list of all the other machines in the cluster. So you can, um, this is a way of making sure that if one of the, the nodes within the cluster goes down, you're able to um, continue making queries against it. It caches a list of additional IPs. Um, we also have uh, some different consistency levels. Um, if you're doing gits, um, within etcd, you may say, uh, do a git on a follower, and that follower may have a slightly older value um, if it uh, was partitioned or whatever for some time. So um, you can actually redirect all of your reads to the master, so you always have the most like, consistent view of the system. Um, but uh, by default, it, it defaults to weak consistency, so you can talk to any of the peers within the cluster. Um, Again, you won't ever get a value that's uh, wrong. You will only ever get values that are slightly out of date. Um, and, then, uh, and then it has the regular operations you'd expect. So after you do new client sync cluster, then you can do set, get, delete, create. And it's pretty much just a thin wrapper on the HTTP um, Go client. Uh, the next interesting thing is Go Raft. So if you want to like go nuts and create your own uh, copy of etcd, um, in about 300 lines of Go, you can actually create a um, thing on top of Raft that has a, um, that uses the same log and um, consensus, consensus algorithms that etcd does, um, over, and over HTTP, like, create a really, really simple key value store um, and, you know, build something uh, that integrates directly with your application. Um, there's two major things that you need to do uh, if you're going to implement Go Raft. The first is there's raft.server. And really the only important API there, you pass in some constructors and uh, various information like IP addresses and stuff. Um, but the important thing is there's server.do. And server.do um, means you get a request, say like uh, set the value to set a value. So you have two parameters, like a key and a value. Um, you pass, you make a command, which is set. You pass in all the additional data, like the name and the value. You call server.do, and then GoRaft handles everything else for you. It uses an HTTP transport by, by default. And so out of server.do, you'll get out either a success object or an error. And on error, it means that the rest of the cluster doesn't, didn't apply the command. And on success, you can return a 200 to, you, to your users. Um, and then the other important piece of the API is raft command.apply. And um, all this does is every single uh, Node, every single peer um, needs to be running the exact same code so that it actually changes the state on itself in the exact same way. Um, and it's just one function that gets called by the server object that's um, 
the, the command and then it runs dot apply on that command. Um, so if you can build your own thing, why use etcd? Well, it turns out it's really hard to like do this all correctly. You need to have cluster configuration APIs. How do I add and remove nodes? Obviously, just having statically defined things in your Go source code aren't, isn't going to work so well. Um, building an API is hard. We're on v2 of etcd's API already. Um, it turns out that it's just these things are really difficult to build um, and you know get all the use cases correct. Uh, yeah, profiling and logging. Um, everything's just, you know, building an application. Um, prototype is easy, but it's details are hard. Um, yeah, so that's that's etcd. Um, and then, of course, I have to do my shameless for us and plug. Um, so, uh, yeah, CoreOS does a lot of open source stuff. Pretty much everything we do is open source. Everything we do is open source. Um, we have 63 repos, uh, and we have three full-time developers myself. Um, so we need help. Uh, and we write a lot of Go. Etcd is all in Go. All of our backend services are in Go. Um, we're writing a, a distributed scheduler in Go. Um, so we have a lot of stuff. And we're building a lot of cool stuff, and it's open source. Um, and that's, that's my slides.